Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. We're just giving some folks some time to um, log into the presentation. All right, and again, we're still waiting for folks to filter in. So we can go ahead and I think get some of the housekeeping duties um, established as well. Great, so today I will be your host. Thank you everybody for joining. My name is Zipporah Fuller. I am the Director of Technical Assistance here at NICUI. Thank you so much for joining us for this last session in our accreditation preparation and best practices series. In the chat box, we have asked for folks to place their name, organization, tribal affiliation, and title into the chat box below. And of course, the survey link is there as well. Next slide, please. And just a little bit about NACUI. Um, so the National Council of Urban Indian Health is a national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. We are the only representative of the 41 Title V urban Indian organizations under the IHC, I'm sorry, IHS, um, in the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. Nakui strives to improve the health of over 70% of the AIAN population that lives in urban areas supported by quality, accessible healthcare centers. Next slide, please. Just a little housekeeping items to keep in mind. This webinar is being recorded. You will be able to find the slides and recording down at the link below, the www.nakui.org forward slash accreditation link. All mics have been muted unless otherwise directed. We do ask if you could turn your camera on to allow for interaction um, if possible. This will be a 75 minute session. You can type your questions into the chat box um, and a Q&A session will be offered at the end of this session as well. Next slide, please. Um, how to ask a question or comment, you'll go ahead and just bring your cursor down to the bottom of your screen and select chat at the bottom of the screen. Then type your question or comment into the chat box, which will appear on the right. And our question chat box monitor Q&A will go ahead and voice those questions for our presenters. Next slide, please. Again, your survey is extremely important to us. So we just ask if you could submit your feedback, let us know how we can improve our services to you. And if you have suggestions or ideas, please let us know as well. Again, the survey link has been added to the chat box. Next slide, please. Some of our upcoming NACUI events uh, are the untold stories of our COVID community of learning experience. Um, we did have a session uh, yesterday, which was a session on data equity within the urban Indian uh, organizations. Our next one coming up is gonna be on April 27th, and that's a spotlight on UIO best practices and lessons learned. Our next uh, session is going to be uh, focused on board of directors trainings. So high performing boards in a virtual world. Session T was going to focus on two sessions, which is the board selection and recruitment and characteristics of high performing boards. We also do have a youth activity coming up for creating touchstones for saying thank you. All of the registration links um, will also be added to the chat box as well. Next slide, please. Today's agenda will feature two um, presentations, the NCQA introduction and presentation, which will be hosted by Christina Borden. And then the second is gonna be the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley, also introductions and presentation to occur from the Indian Health Center Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley team as well. Um, so this is going to be again our agenda format for today. So we do anticipate a 215 adjournment. Next slide, please. So to get into the first speaker, uh, Christina Borden, PCMH CCE, is the Director of Care Delivery Programs and Product at NCQA. In her 12th year with NCQA, Christina oversees the development, implementation, and promotion of NCQA's care delivery programs, including to patient-centered and population health programs to improve care. She maintains and advances NCQA programs as clinical measures and standards change. Additionally, she works to educate stakeholders, interpret and maintain guidelines to ensure NCQA's programs properly align with federal guidelines and the healthcare industry as a whole. Please join me in welcoming Christina Borden as our first presenter. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very happy to be here with you all today to talk about the NCQA uh, accreditation for patient-centered medical home. If you go, go to the next slide. 
So we'll walk through uh, what the medical home model is and uh, NCQA's take on what the standards are. Um, so we'll be walking through the different concepts and competencies that make up the program, talk about eligibility and also how to come through for the program. Also just lightly touch on our behavioral health distinction that is associated with um, the PC MEECH recognition. You go to the next slide. So what is patient-centered care? So we think of these kind of four top of mind things when we think of patient-centered care, having that ongoing relationship with a personal clinician, responsibility for all patients' healthcare needs uh, across uh, all of our lifetime. We're going to be faced with different um, you know, clinical needs, but also social needs and having somebody know uh, how to treat uh, um, and uh, support both is a, one of the core pieces of the patient center medical home. Uh, care for all stages in life and then uh, inclusive of the team. So, uh, you know, I think our experience with the pandemic, we're seeing um, uh, patients interact with care differently uh, with the addition of telehealth, um, accessing care in different ways. And so really having that team-based care model uh, sets, sets um, providers up for success when it comes to the delivery of care. So if you go to the next slide, you can click through all this to get the animation going, but um, you know, more emphasis is being placed on the patient center medical home model. And that's really um, because the model is focused on the whole person um, and making sure that care is coordinated at multiple levels. And so providers that uh, provide care outside of the medical home um, really should be connecting with that primary care provider to make sure the coordination of care is happening. So the graphic shows the medical home neighborhood, understanding that care is not just being given by primary care, but that it intersects at multiple levels. And so the goal is uh, to move from one-on-one -on -one clinician in interactions to a more integrated medical neighborhood. So we're gonna be specifically talking about the patient-centered medical home, which is for primary care providers, uh, but we also have uh, programs for um, the medical neighborhood when it comes to specialty practices and then uh, other ambulatory settings. So if you go to the next slide. So NCQA's PCMH tra transformation really aligns with the quadruple aim in healthcare. And so for years, we've focused on the triple aim of increasing quality, patient satisfaction, and lowering costs. However, there's a, a big piece of that that also is with um, the, the practitioners that are providing care. And so we are uh, fully want to be uh, cognizant of um, a physician burnout as well. And so, but the, the key tenors of the patient center medical home is focused on that triple aim with the integration of uh, the aspect of looking at uh, what happens with the actual practitioners as well. So if you go to the next slide, I think we all can uh, recognize COVID uh, greatly impacted uh, everyone in the healthcare setting. And so as we are um, learning from uh, our uh, patient center medical homes, uh, we've actually uh, seen, seen some positive lights that, you know, as they transformed and um, were able to integrate their teams, uh, also approach telehealth, um, but were set up really for success around care coordination. Um, going through that tra transformation allowed practices to have many things in place that they were able to easily pivot during the time of COVID to still provide good quality care that um, meets patients where they need and addresses the whole person. So if you go to the, to the next slide, this I put this in here because I think whenever um, we, whenever you go through uh, changes and with COVID, I think a good place if you feel like a lot of things have shifted uh, with what um, how care is being provided to patients or what you're addressing, it's always good to go back to the basics and um, like with spring training or uh, you know uh, as you're trying to rebuild, uh, focusing on the core aspects. I think are uh, where where uh, practices should start. And so we'll walk through some of the core uh, core pieces of the patient center medical home program. And I advise you to, as, as you pursue um, uh, accreditation, you focus on those first because that will give you the foundation to build from. So if you go to the next slide. So, uh, the patient center medical home really helps practices focus on the idea of continuously um, supporting practices through value-based care in these different areas. So it's focused on whole person care, using evidence-based guidelines, improving the patient experience, 
looking at care team satisfaction and how the care team is interacting with each other, focus on improved outcomes, lower costs, and then how practices can be successful in a value-based environment. If you go to the next slide. Now, now we're gonna get into the meat of the actual accreditation. So first talking about eligibility requirements and, uh, and practice readiness to come through for, um, for the accreditation. So if you go to the next slide, and I say, I, I know you all refer to as accreditation, we, slight, we use a slightly different term, we say recognition, but it's one and the same. Um, it's just uh, the, um, uh, what, what you're receiving as far as being approved as a patient center medical home. So to be eligible for uh, PCMH, we look at, um, look at it as for primary care providers. So uh, it's, clinician, it's a clinician or a clinicians practicing together at a practice site location. That includes nurse-led practices in states that are permitted to um, allow nurse-led practices under their license, licensing laws. Uh, it does not include urgent care clinics or clinics that are open on a seasonal basis. And we say that, um, just think about, think about the uh, patient-centered medical home as it's, it's, a, it's a, a site that um, a patient can interact with and we're seeing more of it done virtually now, so that's an aspect of it, um, but uh, for that continuous uh, care arrangement. So if you go to the next slide, um, it's, it's at the site level. So we associate uh, recognition with the actual practice site location. We're getting into models where actually it's becoming uh, all virtual care. Uh, so we're adjusting kind of with uh, how models are changing, but currently we look at the actual practice site level MDs, DOs, PAs, and APRM. APRNs are uh, eligible um, for recognition and will be listed as a, so, uh, as a part of the recognition. Um, Non-primary care clinicians should not be included. So uh, we have run into cases where like there's an integrated um, behavioral health provider or uh, OBGYN. Um, so the recognition accreditation is just for primary care providers. Um, we have other programs outside of PCMH, but built on the same principles uh, and core requirements for other, uh, other types of clinicians that they can pursue those other recognition programs. Go to the next slide. Um, in order to emphasize the continuous care uh, piece of it, we, um, we wanna make sure that uh, practices that are coming through are the sole primary care provider for their panel of patients. So we say they should be the primary care provider or team of primary care providers for uh, a majority of their patients, which we put around 75%. We're not stuck at that number, but it just gives folks a general understanding of um, uh, the panel that they should be looking at. If you go to the next slide. So when it comes to practice readiness, um, this really depends on where the practice is in their transformation journey. Uh, so it may take anywhere from six to 12 months is what we've experienced. You might um, be accelerated in some way because you're using uh, electronic health record where you've already done some transformation activities around what you're trying to do around QI or uh, setting up your team. So it really just depends practice by practice. We can't put a definite time frame on it. Um, some of the changes that uh, a practice might have to take is, um, you know, getting that leadership behind the commitment to pursue um, the accreditation, new policies and procedures might need to be outlined uh, for staff, um, staff training and re reassignments, EHR optimization, and then in order to um, uh, access uh, some of the reporting, looking at what those capabil current capabilities are, and then uh, you know, making sure that you have documentation for staff um, as well. So if you go to the next slide. So these uh, next couple of slides get into the actual process of applying for our recognition accreditation. Um, so next slide, please. The first part is committing. You want to determine if you're eligible for PCMH. So going through the eligibility that I had just briefly walked through looking at um, conducting some sort of self-assessment and you can do this by getting our standards and it's just walking through and at a high level checking off you know what you feel is already in place and that will give you an opportunity to identify any gaps and create a work plan from there um, we'll we'll assign you an ncqa representative uh, once you've indicated that you're ready to pursue 
and then um, uh, practices may choose to take live online education courses. I'm giving you kind of the quick and dirty <laughs> here um, on this session, but we do have extensive education courses that get into how you might uh, implement within the practice. And then you wanna enroll when you're ready to pursue, um, you wanna enroll in our uh, technical platform called QPASS. Next. So the transform part of it is where you're coming through um, uh, and demonstrating how you have the different uh, PCMH activities in place. And so you'll do that um, uh, through a, over a course of three check-ins, three virtual check-ins per practice. And we give you up to 12 months to demonstrate that you're meeting all of the requirements outlined. And so um, during that, during those virtual check-ins, you'll get in, you'll uh, get on with one of our evaluators who it, look, don't be scared by it. It's really for them to kind of walk through with you, learn about what you've put in place as far as PCMH, um, and then uh, check off what you're doing or around the requirements to get you to um, the accreditation. And I'll talk about scoring uh, a little bit later on. The next slide. So succeed, so we have commit, transform, succeed are really kind of three areas um, to get through uh, uh, and so um, succeed is the last part. So after you've achieved the accreditation, uh, we've moved to a model where we've moved away from a, a three-year recognition to more of a uh, annual basis. And this is a checkpoint for us to engage with practices um, to say, okay, let's have you check in on what, if you're still continuing the PCMH activities, but we're not going to be evaluating you on everything that you came through before. It's just a subset of the requirements. And we found this is successful for practices because it allows them not to, you know, put things on the shelf and uh, walk away uh, three years later and then they're scrambling to try to get everything back into place. It gives them an opportunity to do um, a, a more regular uh, checkpoint with themselves and us to make sure they're continuing their quality activities. And so you'll submit um, uh, through QPASS uh, that you're continuing on uh, on an annual basis. And so, like I said, it's a subset of the criteria, so it's definitely not as, as um, cumbersome uh, or involved as going through transform. Okay, if you go to the next slide. So getting into the specific uh, standards requirements, um, we have, uh, if you go to the next slide, we have six core concept areas, and uh, these have been pretty similar over the years when it comes to PCMH. We've reorganized and tried to uh, target what, what is meaningful for practices. So we start off with team-based care and practice organization, um, where that's laying the foundation within the team and then building, uh, um, building out what other activities you're doing. And you'll see next to each of the concepts, we have an abbreviation that you'll uh, that you'll see within the educational seminars as well, as well with the standards as far as referring to the specific concept areas and the, the requirements associated. Next, knowing and managing your patients is all about gathering the information about patients and utilizing it um, uh, uh, in order to understand the patient's needs, clinical needs, but also how you can be matching them up with community resources. Patient-centered access and continuity looks at you know, providing uh, that same day access for patients, uh, uh, appointments outside of business hours, uh, looking at what your, your panel um, makeup is and making any adjustments. Care management and support is looking at your high risk patients and where you're able to ma match up your care management resources. Care coordination and care transitions is all about, um, you know, all of the activities that are associated with coordinating the care of the patients, so any lab, test uh, um, results that are needed, uh, making any referrals, and then also understanding the different uh, care settings your, pa your patients might be accessing in order to connect the information back to the primary care uh, provider. And then we wouldn't be a quality organization without having this key concept area of looking at um, quality measures and then setting goals and taking actions to improve. Okay, if you go to the next slide. So just delving into each of the concepts a little bit more, uh, team-based care and practice organization. Uh, this is where you're um, getting leadership behind uh, the commitment to, uh, to implement the PCMH activities. You're looking at what team communication you're doing. So um, this is an area that I think in COVID, uh, PCMH practices were able to really 
trans, uh, transfer it to a virtual setting very easily. Um, so they maybe had some folks that were still going in person or doing a telehealth visit. So um, this looks at having that structured communication where it might've been a team huddle in the morning or you're utilizing uh, communication through your EHR. There's different ways you can approach that. Medical home responsibilities is, you know, uh, communicating amongst the team, what it really means to be a patient-centered medical home, but also to your patients, um, what, why uh, the practice is different because of, of the PCME activities that are in place and what that really means for them and how they should be engaging uh, the practice and updating the practice on their, on their needs. All right, if you go to the next slide, knowing and managing your, your patients, I like to think of this as the data heavy uh, concept areas. This is where you're gathering all of that great data on your patients, not just clinical, but also looking at social determinants of health, behavioral health needs, understanding the diversity of your patient population. And then once you have that good set of data, you're able to do um, uh, you know, those proactive uh, reminders for uh, uh, clinical tests that are needed or coming in for appointments. Um, knowing all of the aspects and the whole person of your, your patient population, you're able to connect them to community resources and understand if there's uh, any um, equity issues uh, when it comes to care as well. So those are all of the kind of themes across these different competencies. We go to the next slide. So patient-centered access and continuity. Um, so, this, so this is really focused on uh, expecting continuity of care so that uh, patients have 24 seven access to the clinical advice and appropriate care facilitated by the practice. So meaning like, uh, like I said, same day appointments, appointments outside of business hours, but that could be met in a, a lot of different ways. We're seeing a lot, a lot of phone calls, um, virtual visits that can meet that kind of outside of business hours needs. Um, but uh, having some way, you know, if, uh, if there's a mom with a, a patient or sorry, um, a kid that has asthma, they're not going into the ER, but they can call some, uh, some form of um, either somebody that's on call at their practice or nurse helpline to get access to the clinical um, uh, guidance there. And then the other aspect here is impanelment. So uh, just regularly reviewing the, the, the practices panel to see if there's any changes. And then um, uh, when it comes to providers, uh, seeing if there's any adjustments that need to be made to individuals panels in order to uh, make sure there isn't any lopsidedness when it comes to, uh, you know, who might have more patients versus the other, and it's just getting to uh, that, that more efficient aspect of delivering care. We go to the next slide. So care management and support. This has practices go through the exercise of um, identifying in, in different categories who their high risk patients might be. So looking at, um, you know, Maybe there's behavioral health, maybe that's, uh, there's behavioral health um, conditions that uh, the practice wants to look at, looking at high risk, high needs patients, um, uh, patients that might be uh, over utilizers, so those that frequent uh, the ER, or um, patients that might be identified by staff or family members just in more high, in more high need of care management support. So, the first part of that is identifying the patients. The second part of this concept is uh, creating that patient-centered care plan um, that includes, uh, you know, that the whole person scope of looking at. Okay, why? Let me understand why um, uh, why the needs might be higher for this patient. Is it something that I that maybe can be addressed socially, or can we create incremental goals for the patients to reduce their blood pressure or diabetes and um, and so uh, creating that care plan and communicating it to the patient so that they can clearly understand what they should be doing, you know, outside of the practice um, to try to reach those goals. Go to the next slide. Care coordinations, care transitions. So this is um, having a systematic way of tracking all of those activities uh, around the patient. So if they're going for a test, documenting that they've, um, they're going for the test. And then if they haven't, if you haven't received the results, following up on those results. Same with referrals. Um, uh, you know, not all referrals need to be tracked. We say those that are the most important to track, but making sure that you have a process to track um, uh, referrals. If they're being made, we find that it's important to track them. Um, and then if you need follow-up results back. And then competency C, um, coordinating care with other health facilities. So knowing if your patients are going to um, uh, 
emergency rooms. We, we don't say, you need to know every, every emergency room like across the state or the county, but um, those that you think that you know your patients are frequenting. And then having some aspect of coordinating and sharing information with that facility. If you go to the next slide. And then lastly, performance measurement and quality improvement. Uh, the, the first part of this is looking at uh, actual clinical measures. And we also ask that you look at a behavioral health measure. Um, so getting the, getting the data and then we're looking for you to do something with it. So setting goals and taking actions to improve. So involving the team, apologies, I have a train going by, um, setting goals and acting to improve uh, around those different measures that you're analyzing and that might change over time so um, you might look at some measures and then you you've done everything possible to get it to a really high high scoring area and so now you may adjust to looking at different measures and then being transparent about how you're performing on measures with with your team with your patients and then um, with the community if you go to the next slide I just have another two more um, so as far as uh, what, what it takes to achieve the accreditation recognition, um, all practices must achieve the 40 core criteria. So across all those different concepts, there's, um, uh, there's core and elective criteria uh, within each of those concepts. And so a practice needs to achieve all 40 across the six concepts and then must achieve 25 out of the six, 61 available elective credits across five of the concepts. If you go to the next slide, this just gives you a different uh, view of um, the scoring related. So needing to meet all the 40 criteria, but we, oh, we've set it up in a way, think about it as kind of like an education model where you're pursuing a degree, you need to take your core classes and then based off of um, uh, the level of interest or what, um, what your patient population's needs are, you can be selecting your uh, elective credits to meet um, what your practice is, is, is doing. And so I think I'm going to stop there just in the interest of time. Um, I did, as part of the slides, we do have a behavioral health distinction um, that tacks onto the PCMH uh, recognition. And so for those um, practices that are interested in pursuing that, there's overlap between uh, the requirements um, from the PCMH recognition to the behavioral health distinction. So if you pursue it as part of your PCMH recognition, you're on your way to um, also achieving the distinction, which is just like that extra gold star on top of your recognition. But I know um, I'm two minutes over, so I'll stop. And uh, if you wanna just skip over these slides, um, you, you can do that. But you, uh, as the attendees, I believe you're getting this and the recording. Um, so you can revisit the slides if you're interested in that. So I'll pass it back uh, for the next uh, presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Christina. We so enjoyed that presentation. I know there's a lot of information needed around NCQA. And so um, as Christina had mentioned, the slides will be made available um, as well as the recording as well for you all to peruse through and take whatever snippets that you feel might be appropriate to your organization. Um, next up, we do have the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley guest speakers. Uh, they do have a team coming uh, to talk about how to apply the NCQA standards into your day-to-day -day UIO interactions. So I'm going to go ahead and start with their bios, uh, and we'll go ahead and begin with Dr. Uh, Balakrishnan. Dr. Balakrishnan has been working at IHC SCV since 2006 and is board certified in family medicine. She is proud of the work that she has done to help IHC SCB achieve accreditation such as the NCQA PCMH recognition and from the AAAHC. Dr. Balakrishnan currently oversees the medical and QI departments. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has been instrumental in leading the healthcare center through the implementation of critical safety measures, telehealth services, COVID-19 testing and vaccination. She loves working with her colleagues and the community members that they serve. Outside of work, she enjoys listening to music, playing golf, and spending time with her family. Next up, we have Dr. Labana. Dr. Labana has been working at IHC SCV since 2012 and is board certified in family medicine. She is proud to serve the Native American community and other underserved populations in the Santa Clara Valley. Dr. Labana's favorite part of her work at IHC SCV is working with members and their family toward creating healthier lifestyles and witnessing them improve their chronic health conditions. 
Dr. Lobana believes that supporting members with preventative care while providing them with ample educational opportunities is the key to member success. Daniela Arcienaga, who is the Director of Population Health, joined the IHC SCB team in 2004. She is committed to the work that FQHCs do for the communities they serve. Her work focus has been around expanding access to care for underserved populations and improving overall population health. She actively designs, participates, and leads teams in innovative projects around quality improvement, data management, population health, and patient engagement. She holds a physician degree from Universidad Mayor de San Andreas in Bolivia. Outside of her work commitments, Daniela enjoys traveling, trying new foods, and spending time with her family and dogs. Jack Glue, Quality Improvement Manager, has been with the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley since 2016. He works closely with data analysts to ensure data accuracy, roll out new programs, and implement and manage quality improvement projects. He collaborates with various stakeholders within the organization for successful project execution and holds a Bachelor of Science in Health Science from San Jose State University. Outside of work, he enjoys the outdoors, cooking, and traveling. And with that, I will turn it over to the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley team. Good morning, everyone. The Indian Health Center is happy to be presenting today on the Indian Health Center's transformation using PCMH standards. Next, please. A little bit about the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley. The mission of the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley is to help ensure the survival and healing of American Indians, Alaska Natives, and our community by providing high quality, comprehensive healthcare and wellness services. So we have four medical sites. We have two dental sites. We have counseling and behavioral health. We have a substance abuse department. We have community wellness and outreach department. We have an intertribal resource department. We provide VIC and nutrition services. We have an on-site lab at our site, and we have a family resource center. Annually, we serve over 22,000 plus patients. We are proud to be NCQA PCMH recognized at two of our medical sites. And we're also the only site in Santa Clara County that is AAAHC accredited since 2010. And all of our medical sites have the AAAHC PCMH accreditation. Next. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Balakrishnan gave introduction about four of our different medical sites. Meridian site is our main site, and it is the first one to get level three PCMH recognition based on the early uh, old standards of the PCMH. We started the process for our Silver Creek site in fall of 2017 after we attended the NCQA conference in last week of July about the new updates in PCMH standards and guidelines. After learning about the new requirements, we met with the QI group and created a PCMH team, included physician lead, which is myself, QI manager, Jack, two more data analysts, and our clinic manager, our front desk supervisor. We reviewed the PCMH manual together, and then we were already doing some of the workflows as PCMH uh, accreditation was already done for our main site, so we were following the same uh, workflows. We started meeting weekly and once a month to run our lists and our progress with Daniela, who oversees the QI team. If we needed any new templates or workflows, she would help us. We presented our work to our weekly QI meetings and took feedback from our bigger leadership group. After uh, the initial meetings, we developed a custom spreadsheet and added all the codes and criteria on it. After about a year of work, we used an internal tracker to check the readiness of our various codes and criteria. Next slide, please. So this slide shows a snapshot of our tracker showing various uh, concepts like Christina mentioned. On the top is showing AC, which is access and continuity of care to the patients. It shows different statuses on the left side, upper corner, like if it was ready for check-in, it was work in progress, we needed to do more, more work, 
or it was not started yet. So different kind of statuses. And then there was an active to-do on the end where we would you know, meet weekly and see what our progress was, what we need to do and bring back to the team next week. So once a core or elective was ready, we uploaded it on QPaaS. When we had about more than 50% work ready, we did our first virtual check-in with our NCQA representative. This is basically a quick overview showing different concepts. Uh, but if you have any questions about how we were doing our internal tracking, uh, we'll be happy to answer at the end. Next slide. When we initially applied for our PCMA certification in 2017, the first thing that we did was conduct a readiness assessment and a self-assessment survey, which helped us basically identify gaps in workflow and processes so that we could make policy changes and uh, train staff accordingly. A few of the things that we identified during this process that we needed to do was implementing same-day walk-in slots and emergency department slots in our schedule. We found the need to add a flow coordinator role to manage patient flow in the clinics. We implemented care teams. We found that we needed to do cycle tracking times. We administered the CAP survey to patients. We implemented patient suggestion boxes in the lobby. We implemented labs and DI tracking for overdue labs and DI. We implemented a preventive outreach team to outreach to patients that were overdue on their preventive health measures. And we also implemented a pre-visit planning tool or called Huddle Sheets from our relevant, which is our population health software. And we also developed care plans in our EHR. Next, please. Danny, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Dr. Balakrishnan mentioned, we identified any gap, I mean, any possible gaps in our processes to be able to meet PCMH standards. We started creating workflows using Microsoft Visio as our flow chart builder. These draft workflows were then reviewed by during our quality improvement meetings before implementation. The following uh, slides will just show some of the examples of the workflows we created through this journey. The phone triage and new member enrollment and eligibility workflow. Next slide, please. The prepare workflow in whole person care. Next slide, please. Coordination of care for hospitalized patients or emergency use uh, uh, workflow. Next slide. Trackable measures workflow. Next slide, please. Care coordination for labs and imaging tracking. Next slide, please. We're happy to share these uh, workflows if you would like them uh, at the end of the, the meeting. Um, one of the chief component, components of PCMH is the enhanced access to care. For this purpose, we created a same-day access policy that included walk-in slots or emergency uh, department, post-emergency post department uh, slots in all providers schedule. This slide shows the details of this policy with uh, walk-in hours, scheduling blocks, or walk in in emergency post ER uh, visits. Next slide, please. The patient flow coordinator role is a position that was filled by one of our experienced medical assistants. This role was vital to improve the efficiency of the visit and communication with our patients. Through a status monitor uh, board mounted in the lobby, we were able to communicate real-time updates with our patients in regards to any delays uh, for our providers and for our Quest laboratory on site. Providers that were on site or out of office and the medical assistants that were assigned to work with them on a daily basis. Next slide, please. The cycle time tracking was another measure we implemented in this journey. By having a way to accurately track all office visit cycle time, we were able to distinguish between the time the patient spends with their physician 
or other members of the care team, which is the value added time, and the time spent waiting, which is the non-value added time. Our goal was not to only reduce the total cycle time, but to also maximize the time the patient spends with their physician and other members of the care team. Our goal was to decrease the total cycle time to less than 60 minutes. We used EBO in our, e in our EMR to obtain the data and analyze it. We first had to train our staff on clicking the right buttons to be able to uh, collect this data. We then standardized it and we were able to analyze the data. Next, uh, um, due to the pandemic, the tracking cycle time was not, has not been conducted as most of the, our visits are via telephone or televideo visits at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide depicts um, how we analyze our data. The top graph will show in the y-axis the number of appointments. The x-axis will show the different providers in each of our sites. The different color graphs will show the green shows the total number of appointments. The blue bar will show the appointments with correctly entered clinic cycle time and the orange bar will show appointments with correctly entered provider cycle time. This was really important for us as we were able to give feedback to the different uh, care teams so we can make improvements. The bottom half of this slide shows uh, the cycle time of the correctly entered appointments. This slide, this data allowed us to see what the average time in clinic depicted by the blue bar was for each of our for each of the patients uh, with the different providers, and the orange bar shows the average time they spent with the provider. This also allowed us to uh, give some support to the uh, provider or clinical teams that were falling behind and having a greater total cycle time in the clinic. Next slide, please. So care teams is one of the important components of patient-centered medical home. In order to improve continuity of care of the patient and using PCM and standards, patients are assigned to care team comprising of providers with few different scope of practices like internal medicine, family practice, pediatrics specialties, and they have their dedicated MAs. Also, they are assigned a care team nurse, a referral staff person, a front team member, so that the patients can get the best possible follow-up and care with the members of the team. It is also helpful as the team is familiar with the chronic needs of their patients and patients are comfortable with the same staff and their providers. Next slide, please. So this slide shows how care teams work around their designated patients. They, they have, these are our different um, teams at Meridian and Silver Creek sites. They are colored differently to help manage their own patients. So it also shows how there is a RN for each care team. There is a family nurse practitioner, uh, MD, there are MAs, and there is other support staff like medical records, health educators, floater MAs, social workers, and eligibility specialists. So they all help so that the patient has a smooth and like their appointments go smoothly, their needs are met, and we help them and give them a high quality of care. Next slide. So uh, COVID-19 has impacted patients and providers in so many different ways. When the shelter in place first started, there were very few patients who wanted to come to the clinic. We quickly developed safe practices around PPE and in order uh, to bring the patients, we reassured them we had to inform them that we were keeping the and work environment safe. We created some changes in the staff schedules to practice social distancing. Some of the staff would work remotely from home. Also, we enabled some slots in the provider schedules, which would say in-person visits only. And it helped to kind of control the number of patients in the lobby. We also helped patients with telephone appointments they were also uh, limited in the number of family members accompanying the patients. 
it was to keep the staff and other patients safe. Although the pandemic has caused a lot of work for descriptions, it did open and push forward for telehealth. It allowed patients and several family members to participate together during each patient visit. Our care teams continue to do their best to provide high quality care. We spotlighted the importance of patient portal implementation. And also this, we had the staff web enabled and port enabled for the portal through how to videos, reference documents. We provided IT support to patients who needed help with setting up their systems. So they were able to connect with the care teams via telehealth platforms. We provided patients with various telehealth platforms like Doximity, Doxy.me, Zoom, Hilo, and it is through our eClinical Health uh, uh, EMR, Hilo, it's a video platform. We uh, continue to provide phone triages by the RNs and offer appointments based on patients' conditions. We continue to have the same day access to the ED follow-ups, the hospital discharge follow-ups. Also, there was point of testing like A1C and lipid test, walk-in immunizations, COVID-19 testing. They were all provided at curbside so that the patients felt secure. They, a lot of patients did not want to enter into the clinics because of the fear from the, getting COVID. We could not uh, perform the cycle time we, uh, uh, Daniela uh, earlier addressed also because some of the staff were working remotely, medical assistants were not able to know when the visit ended and or when the telehealth visit was ended by the provider so that they could check out the patient. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. As Dr. Labana mentioned, COVID-19 impacted our clinical, clinical operations in several ways. One of them was the quick transition we had to make from in-person visits to telehealth. This new model of delivering care had to go through a phase of learning for all of us uh, before we adapted. When we first prepared for PCMH at the beginning of our journey, we used the CAP survey to assess patient experience. When we transitioned to telehealth visits, we wanted to continue assessing patient experience with telehealth visits. For this purpose, we used ECW's custom campaigns to launch a post-visit survey to all of our patients who had a phone or video visit with their provider. This slide will show the data, the analysis of the data of that survey. We outreached all patients who had a phone or a video visit during a certain period of time. This data allowed us to see how many male patients, how many female patients were, were reached, the different age breakdown, and also if the patients uh, completed their survey upon the initial notification or the first reminder that was sent out three days after the, uh, the visit. Next slide, please. And this is more data on the initial notification, the numbers of how many people completed it, how many opened the survey but did not complete it, or how many just disregarded the, disregarded the survey. We wanted to assess different areas that were important to us uh, through this survey. One was the enhanced access to care. And we included questions such as, how e easy was it for you to make an appointment? Were you able to make an appointment when you needed it? Or how long did you have to wait for this appointment? The other area we assessed was perform the performance measurement and quality improvement. With questions such as, did your provider respond to your telephone or portal message within 24 to 48 hours? Did the provider spend enough time with you to address your needs and answer your questions? Or after the visit, did you understand your diagnosis and treatment plan recommended by your provider? We also included a question to assess overall patient satisfaction with the type of uh, 
visit, the telehealth visit, and we uh, included the question of how likely are you to request for a video or phone appointment instead of an in-person appointment uh, if available in the future. Next slide, please. For the in-person visits, we continue to use our patient suggest suggestion box that is in every lobby of our clinic sites. These, comment, uh, these comments are um, collected on a daily basis and they're analyzed in our quality improvement uh, meetings so we can make any improvements if, if needed. Next slide, please. One of the NCQA PCMH standard, standards measure how effectively we communicate with patients. We resorted to using some innovation to communicate with our patients during, during the, to close any gaps in care, uh, which were, was especially hard during the pandemic months. We send patients patient education around preventative measures, such as cervical cancer screening, breast cancer screening, well child care, adolescent well care, immunizations, A1C for our diabetic patients, among others. We used a third party patient engagement uh, platform called Consejo Sano, which translated into English uh, means wise advice. This is an engagement overview dashboard of our efforts between January 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2020. And it shows the number of unique patients that were reached, 20, a little over 29,000 patients with 140,000 uh, messages, SMS messages sent. The engagement rate is not very high, but we um, we understand that our pa patients were very reluctant to coming into the clinic for any preventative measure. So the engagement rate was 4.74. Next slide, please. Aside from the preventative uh, measures, we also um, sent out uh, information in regards to telehealth visits, COVID-19 general information, testing for COVID-19, and more recently, vac COVID-19 vaccination. These, uh, this slide just shows an example how the content was, uh, was developed, and it was reviewed by our uh, leadership team. Um, and the campaigns went out for several weeks at a time, once every week, with different content on the different campaigns. Next slide, please. The next following slides will just show different uh, uh, weekly dashboard uh, information that we uh, shared with our QI meeting and with our um, leadership team on how effective these campaigns were. So this is the breast cancer campaign and it shows how many patients were reached, how many messages were sent, how many of our patients uh, sent us inbound messages, how many were engaged or how many opted out of the campaign. Next slide, please. And this is the same for well child campaign. Next slide. And the A1C campaign, just to show you an example of our campaigns. Next slide, please. We use relevant healthcare as our population health management tool to track and measure all of our quality measures for various programs like GIPRA, HRSA, UDS, and HIDIS. We created a pre-visit uh, planning huddle sheet module in Re Relevant. It shows the individual provider's appointments for the day or the week. MAs would print the huddle sheets a day before. And in the morning, they go over the schedule for the day with the provider. We have like a dedicated 15 minute slot in the beginning of the day for the all the providers so that they can together plan and for the patient's visit and address any care gaps that are flagged on the huddle sheet. So care gaps are then added onto the progress note for that day. Next slide, please. So this is an example of how uh, we were running various uh, quality measures, showing for breast cancer screening, for cervical cancer screening, childhood immunizations, HIV screening, and colorectal cancer screening. And we, as we have different requirements based on UDS or EDS, so we were running different, different, different set of lists. 
uh, for them. Next slide, please. So this is an example of the IHS uh, diabetes audit report. Also, we ran it from the relevant. It will show how uh, we were you know, taking care of our diabetic patients who were uncontrolled with the A1C above eight. We would have a multidisciplinary team meeting every week, which consisted of the site directors, RNs, health educator, registered dietitians. They would go over whatever the patients were due, like a dental exam, they were due for their foot exam, retinal screening, and schedule them accordingly. Next slide, please. This is also an example of the pre-visit planning, the huddle sheet, which is showing on the top the patient's name, the reason for the visit, and the next to it is the care gaps where MAs you know, would note down all the things highlighted, and then we would transfer it into the progress note. Um, it's also just showing what are their next events due, like for example, this patient is due for a mammogram in three months, and then we would schedule the patient accordingly for a next visit follow-up in three months. Next slide. So as Dr. Lobana mentioned, we I, at IHCSCB, we've been huddling for a long time. But the huddle was very conventional. It was um, a huddle consistent of a co-location between the provider and the rest of the clinical care team. During the pandemic uh, months, we had to resort to being a little more creative so we can continue conducting the huddle, be well prepared for the day, and also provide quality care for our patients on a continued basis. So we. Uh, we uh, created this video to show the care teams that huddling is possible, even if some members of the care team may be working from home or may be working in a different location in the clinic. Um, if we could play the video, please. The purpose of the huddle at IHC is to help us deliver higher quality care. The huddle allows us to have an efficient and systematic review of the patient's needs before the visit. The huddle time between the providers and the MA should happen once a day at the beginning of the shift, and all clinical staff who are working this shift should be present and on time for the huddle. Let's start the huddle. I'll call my MA. Good morning, Eric. It's Dr. McCraven. Good morning, Dr. McCraven. How are you? Are you ready to huddle? I'm ready to huddle. Let's get started. The goal of the huddle is to systematically review patients' charts in order to prepare for patients' visits, whether they are in person or by phone or video. The four parts of a good huddle are clinical review, visit planning, merging templates, anticipating needs from other team members. The first step in the hardy huddle is the clinical review. The provider's role in this step is to give a little bit of history and context to patients' visits. Talk about chief complaint in the visit and what the provider anticipates will happen in this visit. So Eric, our first patient today is an in-person uh, visit for a, a two-year-old. He's here for his well-child check. Uh, it looks like he, uh, per relevant, would be due for his uh, hemoglobin uh, test and his lead test. Um, have the SHA and the MCHAT forms been done? Uh, yes, they were. Um, I also checked CARE2 and transcribed it in ECW. Uh, hepatitis vaccine number 2A. Uh, it's got it. The patient got it in LA today. Uh, he is just due for the flu shot and he is, he is up today in this two-year-old vaccine series. Okay, great. Um, let's go ahead uh, and merge in that well child template, okay? Sure thing. Step two in the huddle is the visit planning. For this step, we will be looking at the gaps in care alerts in relevant. Then medical assistant reads the complete list of the alerts to the provider, and the provider makes decisions on what will be done in today's visit in the chief complaint. 
Our second patient is here uh, for a phone appointment. She's 57. She's here for follow-up COPD. And it looks like she's due for her cervical cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, and her hepatitis C and HIV screen. Okay, the MA intake form was completed by the patient and sent to us through the patient portal. Um, I have the fit kit and instructions in Spanish to mail to the patient. I also schedule her PAP appointment within the next two months, and I, I'm going to schedule her a flu appo appointment for uh, for 2020 flu vaccine uh, with the walk-in clinic. Great, great. Let's uh, get her the phone appointment template uh, merged in then. Will do. The third step is to merge the templates. The medical assistant's role is to merge the templates per protocol or as instructed by the provider. In step four, the provider and the medical assistant anticipate and discuss any patient needs with the patient navigator, health educator, RN, or any other member of the clinical team. Patient, uh, let's go ahead and anticipate a referral to WPC team. Uh, you know, she's got at least two uh, chronic conditions and some uncertain social determinants of health. So I'm going to refer her to uh, Cora, uh, our uh, uh, WPC navigator. Okay. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when we applied for the AAA accreditation, we were provided a worksheet um, that basically assesses our readiness for a PCMH health home based on AAA accreditation. So we went through this worksheet that was provided by AAA HC, um, and we identified to make sure that we had all the policies and workflows lined up. So when we had our AAA HC accreditation, we also got our NCQA certification through AAA HC to become a health home. Next, please. So these are the different steps that we had to make sure we had in place to assess our readiness to get our PCMH uh, Health Home Certification through AAAHC. Next, please. Next, please. So this worksheet was provided by AAAHC, so unfortunately I'm not able to share this, but you could, you could look at it here. Next, please. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation in the chat box. Um, I just want to point to the presenter's attention that Mr. Galvez indicated it's a great presentation, loves the personal touch in the video videography. You guys rock. Natasha Green also would love to have this video if it's possible. She's indicated and shared her email address in the chat box. And Mr. Galvez agrees, and if it's helpful um, for training all around. It's a lot of great um, comments in the chat box for our presenters, but currently there are no questions, but we can open up the mic for questions for any of the attendees. Yes, and I'd like to echo the sentiments as well. Thank you so much to our presenters, Christina Borden of the NCQA and the entire Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley team. Such robust conversations and real world examples of how to apply the standards into day-to-day -day operations. So absolutely, if you guys have specific questions, now would be a great time to uh, pull yourselves off of mute and you can get an engaging conversation going. Does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts, praise even? Okay, so I do have a question coming in. Uh, so the question reads, what team member should be included in a multidisciplinary PCMH team or committee? And that's for IHCV or Christine as well. Uh, I could go. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so uh, here we basically had a physician lead we had uh, one of the QI team members, which is J uh, Jack, our QI manager. And we had our clinic manager 
and the front desk supervisor. So because these are all important to kind of, you know, whatever we are going to make changes and then transfer it to the team. And, you know, we would have like a weekly huddle with our team. It's a small clinic, but we would do every Friday to make sure, you know, whatever we were implementing was conveyed to each and every member of the front desk to the back office. So everybody knew the changes and everybody worked to help with the patients to have a good experience with us. Yeah, and from uh, the NCQA perspective, uh, so it's we one of the core pieces of um, the, the team-based care concept is having that clinician lead that is leading and saying, you know, we want to encourage that the PCMH activities are taking place and that we're transforming. And so we we heard from practices and our committees that um, emphasizing that there is a there's a clinician lead that is supporting the efforts. But then it can really uh, span across uh, different roles. So um, having you know other clinical roles, but also um, uh, you know uh, other staff roles because uh, you never know um, where you can be getting information from patients. Uh, sometimes the front of office staff uh, know a lot more about what what's going on in patients' lives um, uh, just due to relationships or natural kind of check-ins. Um, but so I that's just to say. Uh, incorporate a, a variety of team members, and I, I think you'll you'll get to a good implementation of what you're trying to do. Great, thank you so much for for the answer. Um, another question is, where would this new committee, if it is a PCMH committee, start in their journey to NCQA PCMH recognition? Um, so one of the places that I encourage practices to start is looking at the looking at the standards and like what was just shown with um, the checklist for triple AHC, we have uh, some with the standards publication that's similar where um, you can you can walk through and go concept uh, go through the six concepts and really focus in on the core criteria first worry about the electives later and assess what you have in place because most of the time practices, you know, really have a lot of these things in place. It's just maybe making some adjustments, um, uh, 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 kind of documenting what they're doing uh, for, for staff um, because one of the key principles there is like, what if you have staff turnover or staff changes, can somebody step into the role and pick up what needs to be done? Um, and so I would just encourage you to, um, download the standards and guidelines and then focus on those core criteria and really assess where you are. And I think that will give you a good picture of um, uh, where to start. Uh, don't try to do everything at once. Um, maybe it's maybe your work plan is, is best by doing that gap, gap analysis and then you take it concept by concept or I've seen practices, you know, um, uh, focus in on core criteria across different concepts, but taking off little bites at a time so um, there's, a, there's a lot to do, but uh, I just, I, I would encourage you um, uh, to do that gap analysis because you'll learn that you've got, a, I think, a lot of in place based off of kind of how practices evolved over time. Great, thank you. And then you. welcome any perspectives uh, that, that the yeah. other presenters have. I, just well, I think I absolutely agree with what uh, Christina just mentioned. I think really doing a self-assessment and figuring out what you have in place and then looking at the core criteria to see what uh, other gaps that you would need to fill, you know, what policy changes or workflow or staff training that you would need to put in place, I think is a really good place to start. Great, thank you. And again, please feel free to comment in the chat box. Um, and there is one last question that I have on my end. Um, what advice can you give us? I would say, I think, don't be afraid. Like like what you mentioned before, we already do a lot of these things. I think just going through the self-assessment, you kind of, you know, all of this is to improve, you know, patient satisfaction, to improve care, reduce cost, you know, reduce the ER visits. So it's all patient-centric. So um, it may sound daunting, but it actually really helps you improve your internal processes. So I would say just, just do it. It's not as hard as it looks. Yeah, I would also uh, add on to that where, um, you know, I see practices are successful when they're when they're talking with others in their community that have gotten the recognition. And I think this is a great body to facilitate 
uh, just through kind of what I'm seeing in these sessions, a collaborative atmosphere of from learning from each other. Um, uh, we also have um, uh, a, a portal you can uh, log into and ask any question or, or clarification around the, the requirements. We have a team that really turns that around um, within two days, if not faster, or usually it's within a couple hours. If, you, if you're not quite sure what uh, a requirement is or how you might approach it, we can, we can provide some guidance. We can't tell you specifically as kind of the third party accreditor how to do it within your practice, but we can give you some examples of what we've seen and some ideas about how you might approach it. So um, uh, I would just say using that collaborative atmosphere and then um, engaging with us because we really wanna be there to help you through. We don't wanna see um, uh, uh, practices fail. We want, we want to see the transformation happen because we know the outcomes and the benefits uh, outweigh uh, you know, uh, where a practice started from. And so we wanna help you get there. Yeah, thank you both so very much for that. And I just want to open the line again for just a quick, maybe 10 seconds. Are there any lingering questions out there? This is your moment to ask the NCQA representative as well as the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara Valley team as well. I'll just give that a couple of moments. I'm just looking at everybody's beautiful faces. Sonia, did you want to say anything? I just wanted to add, uh, sometimes you think of a question later. So if there's questions that come up, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're always happy to help. And I'm sure that's true for Christina as well. Uh, anything that we can do following the presentation, because sometimes you get back in your clinic and, and realize, oh, I should have asked this particular question. Um, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help. Yeah, thank you so much, Sonia. I do appreciate that. Uh, and absolutely to again all the attendees, this will be uh, that recording session will be posted along with the slides as well. I think you email will also be following this too. So you are more than welcome to also ask our committee staff for technical assistance as well. Um, we just have a couple moments left. And so we wanted to do a post knowledge check uh, just to see uh, what sort of uh, information you were able to garner and potentially apply to your organization. So here's the first poll coming up, our first four questions, I should say. And we'll just give you guys uh, maybe about uh, 30 seconds, 45 seconds to answer these. And then we'll go into uh, some upcoming events. Um, and so our chat monitor can post the upcoming events into the chat box along with all of the registration links. That'd be great. And then we also do have the survey link as well. Um, once you guys are ready to provide feedback, definitely also let us know how we can improve our services and webinars too. We'd love to gather your thoughts and improve our services. Okay, perfect. I think we can go ahead and end polling now. And then we can go ahead and share the results. Uh, yeah, so the NCQA evaluates operations of organizations providing full scope credentialing services, including verification of practitioner credentials. And I will uh, allow Christina, is that true or false? It is true. So we do verify that a, uh, a practitioner's license is, um, you know, that there's nothing against the license and that they're, they're um, they're full practitioners. And so we do do that level of credentialing. It maybe is not as involved as like credentialing when it comes like to health plan uh, accreditation, but we wanna verify that um, they are practicing clinicians. Great, thank you. And then for polling question number two, an organization is not required to have an internal quality improvement process in order to receive credentialing accreditation from the NCQA, true or false? That is false. Um, the, the last concept of the standards is all about quality improvement. So um, we do, uh, you do need to create an internal quality uh, program where you're looking at measures and setting those goals to try to improve around, around those clinical measures and access measures. Great, thank you. And then question three, before undertaking the survey, it is necessary to perform a gap analysis that consists of comparing the NCQA standards to your organization's current processes, true or false? 
Um, so that's a kind of a loaded question because we emphasize that you need it, that it's important to do the self assessment. Now we don't require that you do that, but um, it's a really good idea if you're getting ready to commit to start to come through um, for the, uh, the accreditation that you at least assess that you have some things in place. And so I would say it's a good idea. It's not required, um, but uh, emphasize that you should at least do some assessment. Great, thank you. And then the last question, depending on an organization's readiness, the typical evaluation timeframe in which to earn credentialing accreditation through the NCQA is approximately 18 months from the application submission to the decision, true or false? So that is false. Um, so once a, a practice has decided they want to pursue the accreditation um, and sign up through our, our um, platform QPASS, once, once you've uh, enrolled in QPASS, that sets your clock to 12 months to come through um, and demonstrate that you're meeting the requirements. So um, whether a practice is ready to do that, we don't know kind of the front end of what, um, what practices are going, <laughs> excuse me, um, what practices are going uh, through and how long it's taking them to uh, implement some of those activities. So um, our experience is it really could be anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, and But as far as coming through for the actual process for us, it's a 12 month um, period. Great, thank you so much. And next slide, please. Appreciate your, your information, Christina. And we do have our annual conference coming up, uh, Circle of, of Resilience and Park Indian Country in a Virtual World. Please feel free to register. It is coming up soon, May 25th through the 27th from 12 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining us for this important session today. We appreciate everybody joining in and providing questions to us and to our speakers. Again, thank you so much for your time and imparting your expertise to our wonderful attendees and UIOs. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.